Daniel chapter 6 and reading from verse 1. It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom, with three chief ministers over them. One of them was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the chief ministers and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king plan planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the chief ministers and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So these chief ministers and satraps went as a group to the king and said, may King Darius live forever. The royal ministers, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue, issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree in writing. Now, when Daniel learned that the, the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any God or human being except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, the decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. And they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sunset to save him. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. 
And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Last Sunday morning, we heard about Jeremiah, a prophet in the Old Testament, who had remained in Judah with the remnant of that nation after they had been defeated by the Babylonians and many people had been deported and were now in exile. And the book of Daniel covers some of the 70 years that 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 exile lasted for. First of all, under the Persian king, Nebuchadnezzar, sorry, the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, and then after the Persians had defeated the Babylonians under their king, Darius and Cyrus. The Babylonians had taken some of the best young men and tried to assimilate them into their culture, appointing them to roles in the civil service, effectively. We heard earlier about Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach and Abednego, who wouldn't bow, wouldn't budge and wouldn't burn. And God miraculously saved them. And in many ways, what happened to Daniel later on in the passage that Jeremy read to us under Darius has a lot of echoes of that story, doesn't it? We've called our series leading up towards Christmas, Flawed Faith, F-L-A-W-E-D. Most of the time, we're looking at people whose own human failings were obvious and yet still worshipped God. But occasionally the flaws that we're looking at weren't in the main character, but in those around them. And that's the case here. In both the situation with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and with Daniel, we have a king who thought they were a god, issuing a decree that effectively prevented God's people from worshipping him alone on pain of death. And some of the Jewish civil servants refused to comply. The penalty was applied to them, and God miraculously intervened and saved them. And then the king acknowledged God as king. That's what happened in the verses after uh, Jeremy had finished the, the passage he read. Last week, Tim suggested in his sermon that in many ways, Christians today are living in a similar situation to the Jews in Daniel's day, in that we're in exile. The good old days when church attendance was usual and massive in this country are gone. And now active church involvement as a percentage of the whole population is perhaps only at 5%. Now we could sit down and weep and write Boney M songs about the rivers of Babylon, where we remember the good old days. Or we can follow the advice that Jeremiah gave to the exiles in his letter, to make the most of the situation, to bless and work for the good of the community around us, and get used to being on the margins. The book of Daniel shows us how we can do that. If you read the opening chapter of the book of Daniel, you'll see how he was forced, along with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, to become officials who ran the country for the king. Now, he could have done so half-heartedly, begrudgingly. But Jeremiah had written this letter saying, pray for, work for the good of the community, the city in which you are placed. And I wonder if Daniel had heard those words. He certainly did his best to do that. It's notable how he did his job. As you read the book of Daniel, you would be struck by his wisdom and his insight. Several times he was called on to advise the king to interpret mysteries that nobody else could interpret. Each time he gave a wise and correct interpretation that God had revealed to him, which helped the king and the nation. You would also see, if you read the book, that there are times when Daniel's faith in God came into conflict with his new boss. But each time he stood firm for what he knew to be right. He wouldn't compromise his faith. Yet he still worked hard to bless those around him. I wonder how you feel about that when you think about your own life. 
how do we work for the welfare of the city around us? Do we actively pray for God's blessing on the people in our street, in our neighborhood, in our country? Do we pray for those in government, local and national, global? Do we seek to make a positive difference to the people we are with on a Monday to Saturday? Are their lives better because of us and our prayers? You see, sometimes churches can become holy huddles where Christians almost gather together to hide from the world. But the message of Daniel, the message of Jesus, is that we should be a force for good in our community. If Motley Baptist Church ceased to exist, who would miss us? Daniel asks us the questions about how we can love our neighbours in the way that Jesus spoke of, literal neighbours as well as metaphorical. Are there ways in which we can get involved? Could we do some litter picking in the street around our house? The council will probably supply you with some equipment to help you do that if you want. What about a prayer walk to bless the community? Well, if you're up for that, there's one planned for next Sunday morning. There's details in the weekly sheet. How might God want you to be a blessing to the community around you, to the people you mix with Monday to Saturday? Part of living in exile is get involved in the community. One of the things that marked Daniel out as different was his character. This shines through so clearly in the book. He didn't react badly when he was provoked. He was calm in a crisis. We're told he was neither corrupt nor negligent. So impressive that Darius wanted to make him prime minister. Was he just a good egg? Well, I think you can find the root of it in a theme that runs through the book and particularly chapter six. He was a man of prayer. It was his habit to pray next to a window that faced west towards Jerusalem three times a day. And that prayerfulness, that constant prayer, opened his heart and his mind to God in a way that enabled God's spirit to bear spiritual fruit in his life. During the summer, we looked at God's spiritual fruit uh, in our morning services. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And those godly qualities were evident in Daniel's life too. They're things that God grows in us as followers of Jesus. We can't force these things to grow in ourselves, but God's spirit can grow them in all of us. And we find it easier to respond to people in that godly way, to show those characteristics, if we are keeping in step with God's spirit by living a prayerful life. It's no coincidence that people I look up to as the most godly people are also prayerful people. Here's some thoughts as to what might help you to be a prayerful person. Maybe like me, you need some prompts. Well, you could take a post-it note and write a reminder to pray and stick it somewhere obvious that you will see on a regular basis, on your mirror, in the bathroom or on the fridge, on your car dashboard. Maybe there's a picture that prompts you to pray. Make it your phone wallpaper. So when you look at your phone, you think, oh, pray. Maybe there's a song that you find helps you to think prayerful thoughts. Make it your phone ringtone. <laughs> you might get some interesting questions from people about that. Whatever it is that helps you to develop the habit of prayer, the more we do it, the more instinctive it becomes and the better our relationship with God becomes and the more this spiritual fruit grows. Another thing that we need to recognize in exile is to accept that bad stuff happens. 
Jesus never promised his followers that they would have an easy life. In fact, he promised the exact opposite. It shouldn't surprise us when we face difficult times. It shouldn't shake our faith. Well, I didn't expect it would be that difficult. And if, like Daniel, we find ourselves in circumstances where our faith is shaken and our life is thrown upside down, like Daniel, the best response is to pray. And yes, you can pray that God will take away whatever it is that's causing such pain and difficulty. But recognize, too, that sometimes God doesn't take those things away, but allows those things to help to shape us and to grow that godly character from within us. As I said in the summer during that series, the best fertilizer for, for growing fruit is often smelly and organic. Let's also be aware that if we show godly character, it will lead to some people not liking us. There are incredible parallels between Daniel's experience and Jesus. Both of them were hated for their goodness because it showed other people in a bad light. And in fact, the early Christians found the story of Daniel was really inspiring and encouraging to them. So in the catacombs under Rome, you find pictures the Christians painted of Daniel and the lion's den. And bearing in mind what they were doing to Christians in those days, you can see why the lion's den story spoke to them. But both the story of Jesus and the story of Daniel show us that goodness provokes a reaction. But let's be clear, only evil can be offended by godliness. God won't always prevent the fire from burning us. He won't always keep the lion's mouths closed. He might, but it might not happen. But he does promise that he will always be with us. He promises us that if we're at the end of our tether, he's with us there. And he promises to be gentle with us. Not snuffing us out like a smouldering candle wick. And he promises that there's nothing on earth or above or below it that can separate us from his love. Did you notice what Darius said, just as Daniel was about to be lowered into the lion's pit, he said, may your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. Daniel's faith was clearly obvious. I think Darius offered that prayer more in hope than expectation. But he had seen Daniel day by day living out his faith. He was an example of the Hebrew word avodah. The Hebrew word avodah means work and it means worship. They're not separated. Daniel's work was his worship. He was a living example of what Paul wrote about in his letter to the church in Corinth, that whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Whatever he was doing. Whether Daniel was doing administration, carrying out the king's commands, giving advice or anything else, he was doing it for the glory of God. And the king had noticed. And that could be true for us too. For our work, whether it's paid or voluntary, whether it's in our homes or in a workplace, we can do it all for God's glory. Even the most mundane or disgusting task can be done as an act of worship if we decide that I'm doing this for you, God. Recognizing that work and worship are two sides of the same word. And maybe to help you, you might find listening to some worship songs will help you or sing them in your head if you're not having to concentrate too hard. Maybe you could make it a ritual that when you sit down at your desk or whether you, when you start to do the work that you would normally regularly do, that you consciously say, God, help me to do this today as an act of worship to you. 
Maybe if you've got something really important, really significant that you've got to do in the coming days or weeks, you could ask a friend to pray for you, particularly, particularly that you might do it as an act of worship to God. Anything that we do consciously offering to God can be an act of worship. And because it is, we will do it to the best of our ability. And if we do that, people will notice, just like Daniel was noticed. They might not say anything, but they will notice. You may not see a wonderful transformation and coming to faith like Daniel saw in Darius after he came out of the lion's den. Darius gave glory to God and made an edict that everyone had to honor Daniel's God. But God could be using your example to help someone on their journey towards faith in Jesus, even if you're not aware that he has used you in that way. Work and worship are two sides of the same thing. The story of Daniel isn't just about his godly character and the way that God miraculously vindicated his faith. It's also about standing for what is right. And as we said earlier on, that's a relevant theme for us today on Remembrance Sunday, isn't it? How did Daniel do that? Well, I think we come back to his three a day prayer habit. He walked closely with God and the spirit kept him on the right path. Those who wanted to get rid of Daniel were motivated by jealousy and hatred. The same sort of jealousy and hatred that led to Jesus being crucified. And those feelings don't have their origin in God, but godliness can provoke them. Because it's like a light that shines on someone's life and reveals to themselves their own selfishness. And they may not consciously realize it, but they're reacting against God's spirit, who's provoking them to consider their own motives in their life. Stand for what is right. At a time when our parliament is mired in scandals, perhaps Daniel speaks to us about the integrity of those who serve in government. His opponents couldn't find any corruption or negligence in him. But not many of us serve in government here. Perhaps he also speaks to us about those times when maybe someone asks you to turn a blind eye to something. Or someone says, well, everyone else is doing it, so why don't you? Whether it's fiddling your taxes or not admitting when you've been undercharged, it's very easy for those things just to work their way in. There are many opportunities for us to give in to temptation. But those are also opportunities for us to stand up for what we believe in. And who? we believe in. On Remembrance Sunday, when we recall how women and men gave their lives to preserve our freedom, how others still bear the physical, mental, emotional scars, let's resolve again to ask God's Spirit to help us to stand firm for what is right as we live in exile. Let's pray together. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the example that Daniel has given us of how to live in exile. And Lord, we might not like to admit it, but we recognize that we're on the margins of society. More people have driven past and walked past this building today than are in it. Lord, we pray, help us. Help us to live in exile in such a way that we make a positive difference in the community, that we make a positive difference to the place where we live and work, to the people around us, not for our own sake, but for theirs and for yours. Help us to see how our work can be an act of worship. And help us too in those moments when we 
need to stand for what is right, to have the courage to do so. May it make a positive difference. Lord, we pray for all those with whom we work and ask that you will bless them because of us and bless them because of you. Amen.